This is the Teletype Model 43 teleprinter. This is the first computer I ever used, or rather the first computer interface I ever used. I don't remember what type of computer was on the other end, but I know it was miles away. The system was called Otis, or Oregon Total Information System. It was a timeshare system used in schools all over the state of Oregon. We had a few of these terminals in different locations around my high school. Student logins would drop you to a basic prompt, and I remember playing games like Star Trek and writing my own basic programs on one of these. This is a basic KSR version, or keyboard send and receive. This version is a 132 column tractor feed version, which uses 11 inch wide paper. It's kind of hard to find nowadays. There was another version that was friction feed using rolled paper that was 80 columns. There was an optional paper tape punch sidecar for these, but those are very rare and hard to find. We did have one when I was in school on one of the terminals that we had. We had about three terminals in the school, I think. One was in the library, one was in the computer lab, and there was another in the office. I bought this one on eBay last year, got it cleaned up and working, but uh, just last week I was able to get the ribbon re-inked and working so that I can actually use it. And coincidentally, last night I was down in the garage digging through some old boxes looking for some things. And I dug into a box of uh, computer books and papers that I had from back in my high school days, and I found this. The only explanation for having one of these in a box of old books from that time frame is that I must have stolen this from my high school. I can't imagine why I would have deliberately stolen it. I didn't have a 43 and never expected to have one, but I must have borrowed this from school and just never returned it. I should apologize to Thurston High School for taking this book and of course for taking any other items that I might have borrowed during my years there. On the back there's a 25 pin RS-232 port. Some models had a built-in modem with modular telephone jacks here instead. But here's the power switch and the fuse holder. And these bolts are for mounting the paper holder. On the front there's a pull-out card for frequently called phone numbers. When I was in school, we must have had dedicated lines because we never had to dial. They were just always connected. On the back side of this card, there's a maintenance record form. This one seems to have an asset tag from some company called Lisa Metric. The keyboard is pretty clicky. Along the top here are the controls. Local for local mode, uh, when it just acts like a typewriter and prints anything you type. Data. Uh, the data light indicates a carrier detect, uh, and the system won't go into data mode unless there's a carrier detect. I actually had to hack that on the RS-232 to get it to work. Terminal ready, uh, I believe that asserts DTR, and on the units that have the built-in modem, this is actually labeled auto answer. Interrupt sends a break signal, and the alarm light is just a light, there's no button. Uh, this lights whenever you lift the top or if it's out of paper or any other sensor inside shows something wrong. The printer test button prints a test pattern and over here we have our parity control, duplex, half or full duplex, and the baud rate control. This is for 300 baud up or 110 baud down. On the front here are two square impressions that spring out to latch the cover on. Just press in on both sides to lift the top cover up here and here. Lifting the top cover will trigger the alarm light and stop printing because this spacer right here presses down on this interlock switch. So when you lift the cover, this switch comes up and the system knows the door is open. You can lift the whole top cover off and remove it. The cover on the dot matrix print head here just lifts right off. And here you can see the individual magnetic coils for each print wire. When the coil energizes, this lever gets pushed forward, pressing one of the wire pins forward. Removing a couple of screws on the side here, you can lift the keyboard up out of the way. These dip switches right here control things like the font, the line length, parity type, and uh, carriage return line feed behavior. And you can see the bell. These two screws here remove the back. And 
and these two screws up front here allow you to slide the whole thing out of the chassis. In the back is the power supply. On the right side is the print head motor. And on the left side is the paper platen motor. The power connector here and the serial connector here. This is a TTL level serial and this board over here does TTL to RS-232 conversion. This PCB on the back of the 25 pin connector contains a line driver and line receiver chips for converting to RS-232. The system wouldn't transmit or receive anything without a carrier detect originally and because Hayes modems require you to transmit before you have a carrier and most modern systems only have transmit and receive, I had to modify it. I took the green wire here from here and tied it to ground. That forces a permanent carrier detect so the system will always transmit and receive. I've learned not to store it for any length of time with the ribbon installed. This is the ribbon that came with the unit when I bought it. And you can see that it's stretched out and too long here. The ribbon tensioner spring right here is at the end stop and unable to actually tension the ribbon any more than this. I guess the original ribbons were held in magnetically, but the newer ones have this plastic clip that holds it in place and no magnet on the bottom. There are instructions on the back side of the top cover for installing a new ribbon. When a ribbon is new, most of the length will be coiled up on the inside. So putting a new one on would just put it around the tensioner first. Stretch it. And snap it in place. I was able to find another ribbon that's not so stretched out. You can see how much tighter it is on the tension arm there. When you lock the head forward, that leaves plenty of tension on the ribbon there. Always remove the ribbon when it's not in use to keep it from stretching out and store it in a plastic bag so it doesn't dry out. Here's the inside of the ribbon. This space here is where the ribbon would be coiled up when it was new. This here is a spongy roller that should be soaked with ink. This one's dried out. But when this is soaked with ink, it uh, transfers on this transfer roller onto the ribbon and continuously re-inks it. On a recommendation from someone else, I got some of this black inkjet refill ink. And I use that to re-wet the re-inking sponge and then just let the normal advancing of the ribbon re-ink it. To load paper, you lift up the out of paper sensor until it locks and lift up the flap there. For fan fold paper, <clears throat> I don't use this roll paper holder. When you lift this up, that drops the out of paper sensor. It locks forward and we're all set. When we turn the power on, we have an alarm light because the cover's off. We can hold the cover sensor on and do a print test. I have it connected up to my IDP 11 here, which is just a Raspberry Pi. 
in a fancy case. As soon as the Pi starts up, we should get a login prompt on the terminal. When you're at the login prompt, pressing enter up tells the Pi to switch to the next configured baud rate. Once we're logged in, of course, we can telnet. And just for fun now, I'm hooked up to the old US Robotics Sportster. Type AT, we get a response from the modem. So let's try dialing in AT DT. One, one six, nine six five, one seven zero one. That's it for now. I'll leave you with the sound of the 43 running at 10 characters per second.